Wait, David, wait to share your screen. Wait. Uh, wait to share so Ilaria can be on the. Ah, okay. Sorry, sorry. Thank you, David. So, uh, hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. So I'm Ilaria Castellani, and it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Davide San Giorgi, who has been a longtime colleague and friend. Actually, Davide hardly needs to, an introduction at this conference, uh, since he's very well known for his highly influential work in concurrency theory, which is also testified by his impressive number of papers at Concur. I counted 12. Anyway, let me recall some elements. Davide got his master's degree in 87 from the University of Pisa and his PhD in 92 from the University of Edinburgh, where he was a student of Robin Milner. And these years in Edinburgh were uh, most exciting and creative for Davide. In particular, this was a time when he wrote two seminal papers for which he was to receive the Test of Time Award many years later, respectively from Leaks in 2000 and 13 and from Concur in 2020 last year. Both these papers appeared in 93. The Concur one introduced the notion of open by simulation, which was to find many application and the Leaks paper written together with Benjamin Pierce introduced input output types for the Pi calculus, which paved the way to the development of type theories for concurrent calculi, including session types, which are the topic of the next session today. So on a more personal note, I met Davide for the first time in 91 at a workshop <laughs> organized by Gerard Boudol and myself in Antibes. He was still a PhD student in Edinburgh at the time, and he must have liked Antibes very much because after completing <laughs> his PhD and working some more time in Edinburgh uh, as a research assistant, he joined our team at Inria Sophia Antipolis in 95 as a permanent researcher. And he stayed with us for seven years and this again was a very fruitful period where he uh, notably wrote his book on the pi calculus with David Walker which is uh, regarded as a kind of pi calculus bible uh, but after seven years in France uh, Davide was longing to go back to Italy and in 2002 he was appointed as a full professor at the University of Bologna where he has been working ever since while still maintaining strong links with INRIA now, uh, for contribution, as most of you know, David has been giving numerous fundamental contribution to concurrency theory and to the foundations of programming languages, notably on the Pi calculus, as we just saw, and also on co-induction based proofs. And his influence on the community is further witnessed by the number of students and young researchers that he trained and inspired, most of which are successfully making their way in academia. David has held a number of prestigious uh, uh, responsibilities and he earned several distinctions to mention just a few. He's a member of Academia Europea. He's been the chair of the IFIP Working Group 2.2 on formal description of programming concepts for eight years. He received the Outstanding Service Award from IFIP in 2012. And last but not least, he has been recognized as a fellow of the ATCS this year. So I will conclude by recalling that besides his book on the Pi Calculus, Davide wrote also two other books that became reference books, which were both on co-induction, and one of them was written with Jan Houten. And uh, co-induction is precisely the topic of his talk today, so I leave uh, the floor to Davide now. Please, Davide. Thanks a lot, Ilaria. Uh, very nice. I mean, I was very lucky to have Ilaria as, uh, as a chairman. As a Chairwoman. <laughs> Very nice, <laughs> very nice chairman, besides being a, a very nice person, of course. I mean, too nice. I mean, now I, I feel kind of uh, embarrassed after <laughs> this introduction not to be uh, up to the standards. Thanks a lot also to, to the organizers uh, of the conference for uh, inviting me. As, as Ilari was saying, I'm very keen uh, on the Concur conference, the conference that I like very much, and I always try to to be at the conference uh, uh, if possible. Let's hope that uh, soon we will be able to meet uh, in presence. Okay, so um, uh, coming, to, coming to the talk, this is going to be a, a rather foundational talk uh, because I will talk about uh, the nice old behavioral relations, uh, both equivalences and, uh, and the pre-orders. Uh, 
is something so this is something that is a basic this, this is a fundamental for any reasoning techniques there are many ma very many behavior relations uh, and i refer for this to the well-known uh, spectrum paper by rob van glabek in fact in the previous session rob has added uh, even one more uh, uh, equivalence to the spectrum and uh, uh, well uh, the the uh, the debate on uh, you know, what is the best behavioral relation has been has, has produced many words, both written and uh, and spoken, with a uh, with a debate that has been particularly intense between mid seventies and mid and and uh, mid nineties. Um, however, among all these behavioral behavioral relations, uh, uh, we can uh, um, we can approximately make a first. Uh, um, say, uh, classification between, uh, say, the, the conductive ones, things like by similarity and uh, similarity, and the inductive ones. And by inductive, I mean behavioral relations uh, that are based on uh, observables that are inductively defined. So typically traces or enriched form of trace. Um, for, the, for the conductive ones, uh, something that is particularly uh, prominent is uh, the proof method, so the by simulation of the conduction proof method, something that stems directly from the definition of a conductive object, and is something that makes proof uh, particularly effective, something that is simple, elegant, it is also, it is also mm, mathematically very robust. Um, um, and furthermore, this method can be enhanced, so in the, over the past 25 years or so, theories of enhancements have been produced, uh, some of them with an algebraic flavor. And uh, um, with these uh, enhancements, uh, uh, proofs can be sometimes uh, even, uh, well, much simpler. Um, and also the enhancement make it possible to uh, say, to, 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 to use the proof method more easily in, uh, in new settings. In fact, the proof method is used not only in uh, concurrency theory, uh, though it, where it was uh, invented by Milner and Park, it was discovered by Milner and Park, but also outside the concurrency theory in many areas of computer science and as well as beyond um, computer science. So in the first part of the, of the talk, I will describe, uh, I will give an overview of theories of enhancements um, of these methods. And in the second part of the talk, I will discuss uh, an attempt at transferring these uh, conductive enhancements to the realm of the, uh, to the inductive realm using notions like weight and uh, approximants. And probably I will not have time to discuss uh, strong versus weak uh, semantics. So at Concur, uh, uh, I can be very brief about the introduction to of uh, by simulation, uh, by simulation to the relation on processes that pictorially can be uh, written in, in this way. So whenever there is a pair in uh, in a, in a by simulation, then there is a challenge from one process should be answered by the other process and uh, uh, conversely. Then by similarity, which is the equivalence that we are interested in, is the union of all by simulations. And this immediately gives the by simulation proof method to prove the processes by similar, find a by simulation containing uh, these processes as a pair. So I said, this is a very effective method, yet uh, it may be hard sometimes to apply the method if the state space of the two terms is infinite. So for this reason, enhancements have been put forward. In fact, the first enhancement was put forward by Milner himself very shortly after the introduction of bisimulation. Um, is, this is bisimilarity up to bisimilarity. So in this talk, enhancements, I will view enhancements as functions on relations uh, that make the bisimulation diagram written in this way. So you see now the challenge response game is played in such a way that the derivatives uh, need not be in R, they can be in F of R. Um, of course, not all functions uh, F uh, can be used for this. The enhancement must be sound. Uh, sound meaning that whenever this diagram holds, and by the way, we call these diagrams progressions. So whenever R progresses to F of R, F of R then indeed it is the case that R is contained in bisimilarity. Furthermore, the enhancements to be useful must be such that R is smaller than F of R. Why that? Well, because you see, when you have something, when you have this diagram, you have to prove this challenge response diagram for each pair, okay? So if, if your candidate relation is smaller, then you have fewer pairs uh, to check, so you have less work uh, to do. 
in fact, uh, briefly, very briefly, the goal of the enhancements is to be able to work with relations that are as small as possible, so to, so to have uh, uh, less work uh, uh, to do. Here are some examples of uh, uh, enhancements. So the first is uh, the by simulation up to by similarity that I mentioned before, it was introduced uh, by Miller, um, where uh, it is sufficient that the two derivatives at the end are by similar to processes that are in R. So you, I think you can see what the function of the enhancement is, is a function that uh, extends R by adding all pairs of uh, processes that are component-wise by similar to the original pairs. Um, another enhancement is by simulation up to context. This is uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's quite handy. It's in this enhancement, uh, uh, the, if the two derivatives have a common context, then you can cut this, this common context off, and it is sufficient that what is left uh, is in R. Um, and there are many more uh, enhancements. In fact, uh, the more feature uh, your language is, uh, the, the larger the spectrum of possible enhancements uh, is. Okay, so we will not mention more enhancements. But something that I want to mention is the fact that uh, it is often useful to be able to combine enhancements. So in this case, for instance, I am combining up to by similarity and up to context, and this is the uh, and this is what we get at the end. Um, why is this useful? Well, because, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the two derivatives p' prime p' prime might not have immediately a common context, so you might have to do a little bit of work, transformation in the processes so to bring this context up. Um, so why are we interested in enhancements? Well, as I said before, to simplify proofs. Um, also, enhancements can be used to improve the efficiency of algorithms and tools. Um, enhancements can be useful to be able to define the candidate relation in a bisimulation proof. You know, so if the state space of, uh, of a bisimulation is infinite, sometimes it actually can be difficult to even define what this bisimulation is. And so enhancement can be very handy then. And sometimes, in fact, enhancements allow you to, uh, to, to, um, to obtain a candidate relation that is finite, whereas the smaller containing by simulation would be infinite. Enhancements are particularly uh, important in languages with, uh, say, mobility and higher order features. So features like those we have in PyCalculus and the calculus. And in these languages, I would say that when you do a by simulation proof, you, you, you know, any non-trivial proof, you really, uh, you know, normally use some kind of uh, enhancement. Um, here is an example of application of uh, by simulation enhancements. Uh, this is uh, an example of uh, about uh, two servers, an eager and a lazy server. So the specification is that we want to have a server that when contacted uh, by a client at the channel C, it starts a certain in interaction protocol with the client, which is a process that I've written here, this R process, after consulting an auxiliary server A at the channel A. Um, so we consider two implementations of the server. One is an eager implementation in which uh, the server anticipates the, the interrogation to the uh, auxiliary server um, before the client makes a request. And the idea being that, uh, uh, you know, in this way, when the, when the request from the client uh, arrives, uh, then uh, the server is uh, immediately ready to, to start off the interaction protocol. Okay. In the lazy server, instead, the, the order between the client request and the interrogation of the server is, uh, is swapped. So uh, the lazy server waits first from, from a, a, client, from a, a client request before uh, interrogating the auxiliary server. Um, but so you see that the servers are uh, recursive, so there are recursive calls. I have added some tow here just because uh, I want the example to, be, to work under a strong semantics. Uh, these tiles are not, in a, you know, they, in a weak semantics, they could be thrown away. Um, and, um, well, so what we want to do is we want to compare the eager and the lazy systems. And so uh, these two processes here, where N is the state of the auxiliary, the auxiliary server, the auxiliary server is a deterministic server that sends out an integer and uh, it then progressively increases such a, such integer. And we wish to prove that, uh, the two, that these two systems are uh, equal. 
this is a, by itself is um, a non-trivial task because uh, um, the systems in question they are they are infinite state. Uh, they are infinite state because there can be uh, unbounded many requests arrive, arriving from clients, and these requests start off interrogation interaction protocols. These processes are here. Uh, and there, so there can be unbounded many such sessions uh, uh, running in parallel. Moreover, this interaction protocol can be any process. So I'm not saying I'm not uh, uh, say I'm not giving I'm not saying that this equality should hold no matter what the, the interaction protocol is. Um, using enhancement, the proof can be um, particularly simple. Um, so we uh, it's sufficient to take uh, to work with uh, relation R that has just. Uh, uh, one pair of uh, eager and lazy uh, system for each n, and to prove that there is a progression from R up to by similarity and context. And the proof essentially goes like this. Uh, so you, see, you, know, you consider a, uh, an interaction from a challenge from the eager system. Uh, this is a challenge in which the eager system interacts with the auxiliary server. Then you get this process here, the lazy system answered using this code here, then you get these processes. Now you apply some algebraic, uh, uh, transform, some simple algebraic uh, transformations. The main one, the main, the main laws that you use is expansion law. So to, to bring up, uh, to, to pull out uh, the next possible actions. And in this way, you end up with these two systems down there in which the red part is a common context that you can cut off up to context. And so what is left are two processes that are again in the original pair. Why theories of enhancements? Well, the obvious, uh, the obvious, uh, for, for the obvious reasons, uh, for, because we want, to, we want to use theory of enhancements so to be able to define new enhancements, to be able to apply them more easily to a new setting. Um, but, uh, uh, and uh, um, well, above all, I would say, and perhaps summarizing uh, uh, the previous points, to understand what enhancements are. And I'm stressing this point because uh, in this business of enhancements, um, sometimes intuition can fail us. Uh, they can be deceptive. Um, consider, for instance, the previous examples that I have given um, by stimulation up to by similarity. Well, it look, the intuition is that uh, this enhancement is sound whenever by similarity, the, equi the, 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 the equivalence, uh, uh, the, the, the still the equivalence is, is transitive because you see um, in, the, in, the, in the game, uh, we are obtaining this derivative p prime q prime. We are not checking uh, this derivative any further. We are moving to p second, p second. But if we can prove that p second and q second are bisimilar, and we know that bisimilarity is transitive, then from the equality between p second and q second, we can indeed infer that between p prime and q prime. Um, by simulation of two contexts, while well, this looks uh, that it should be sound whenever um, by similarity is substituted, is preserved by context, because uh, uh, you see, if I can prove the equivalence between P prime and Q prime, then, uh, then uh, if by similarity is preserved by, uh, by the context C, then I can infer that between C of P prime and C of uh, Q prime. And similarly, for by simulation up to by similarity and context, it, it looks as if, so the intuition is, that this is sound whenever by similarity is both transitive and substitutive. So it is a congruence, for instance. Um, but this is false. It's surprising that this is false. This is a simple counterexample. Uh, it's, this is a small process language in which by similarity is indeed a congruence. So it's transitive, substitutive. And yet the technique fails because I have to use the technique to prove that A is the same as AA, which is clearly, uh, which is clearly false. I don't do not go into the details of this, uh, um, um, but uh, anyway, this is uh, this just to show just, just to, to show that uh, intuitions are, are, are can be a little bit delicate here. Another example is uh, in the setting of weak by similarity, so weak semantics where one starts from tau action uh, by simulation up to by similarity up to weak by similarity is unsound, yet it has been around and used for about ten years before. Uh, realizing that it was unsound. So uh, the topic of uh, uh, by simulation and co-induction enhancement, because by simulation is an instance of co-induction, has been and still is uh, an active research topic for the past, say, 25 years or so. Um, 
Um, and here is some of the main achievements. Uh, so theories of uh, enhancements uh, with uh, theories of algebras of enhancements have been produced using uh, notions such as respectful, uh, based on notions such as respectful and uh, compatible functions. Um, abstract formulation of the enhancements uh, have, been, uh, have been produced uh, in which uh, with the idea of lifting uh, the, the, the uh, by simulation enhancements to the setting of co-induction and for this using means such as complete lattices, fixed point in complete lattices, category theory, algebra, uh, vibration. Uh, many people have worked on that, there have been many for mentioning them here. Um, there have been uh, very many people have worked on applications of the enhancements to different language paradigms. Uh, there have been work on the um, using the enhancements to improve the efficiency of algorithm and tools. Uh, I could mention, for instance, here uh, the paper uh, that uh, was written some a few years ago by uh, Bonke and Puss, where they show that uh, even algorithms that were thought to be very well established, like the algorithm for checking uh, language equivalence in non-deterministic finite automata, they can be um, well substantially improved using the enhancements. And then there have been uh, interpretation of the enhancements using uh, unique solution of equation. Connection have been drawn also to with abstract interpretation. In this talk, I will focus on the topic of algebras of uh, enhancement. Why algebras? Well, because there are many enhancements. Because as I said before, the soundness proof uh, uh, can be delicate. And because above all, we want to be able to, well, because of the previous reason, we want to be able to combine enhancements. You know, we want to use an algebra for combining enhancements. So to derive for free uh, complex enhancements from simpler ones. Um, for these purposes, the set of sound functions is, uh, is not, does not seem to me good enough. It doesn't seem to have uh, good compos compositionality properties. So in this talk, I will, uh, I will consider, I will give you an overview. Well, we will we'll mention the respectful function. Um, so this is a subset of some functions uh, that have uh, good compositionality properties. So what is a respectful function? This is the definition in yellow. The important thing is the thing is the part on the right. Um, so if a relation R progresses to a relation S, then F of R progresses to F of S. So respectfulness is essentially a property of, about uh, uh, progression preservation. Okay. Um, some example of respectful function, the identity function, uh, the constants to bisimilarity function, mapping every R onto bisimilarity, closure under monadic context in CCS. Uh, a non example is the function mapping all relation to the universal relation. And the respectful functions have uh, interesting compositionality property. So we can compose uh, respectful functions so to obtain other respectful functions using several constructors like uh, function composition, union. So the union of a bunch of function uh, is a function that gives you as a result uh, the union of the, of the output of, this, of the component functions. Uh, chaining, which makes uh, relational composition. Uh, this is relational composition, not function composition, relational composition. Um, so this is some, 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 some example of constructor that one can use. And with this uh, very few constructor and simple basic uh, function, I can already derive something uh, in, in a little bit interesting. For instance, uh, Milner up to by similarity can be derived using chaining, starting from the identity and the, uh, and the constant to by similarity function. I can derive up to transitive closure of a relation. I can derive up to polyadic context, up to by similarity in context, and, uh, and uh, so forth. Now, I want to give you a little glimpse of uh, how uh, this uh, theory of enhancement can be linked to the setting of co-induction. And for, use, I will, for this, I will use, um, I will use, um, I will, uh, Use a meaning of a meaning of to induction in the in the setting of complete lattices and uh, and uh, fixed point theory. So in this setting, to induction stems from knaster tarski theorem. The theorem tells us that uh, ensures us that a monotone function, a monotone endo function on uh, on the on the complete lattice has a greatest fixed point. And as a, as a simple corollary of, uh, of uh, the theorem, we get that to prove that the point is below the greatest fixed point of, uh, of the function, 
then it is sufficient to prove that the point is a postfix point of the function. This is a postfix point. Um, this is the conduction proof method, and one can show that uh, this is uh, that effect by similarity can be recasted in this uh, in, in in this way using uh, uh, an using a formulation of by similarity in the complete lattice of all relation on uh, on processes where by similarity is then the greatest fixed point of a certain function. Um, so in this complete lattices, what is an enhancement? Well, suppose that B is the function that we are interested in. So we want to reason on the, on the greatest fixed point of, uh, uh, of B. Um, another function, F, is, uh, uh, is a candidate enhancement if it is uh, sound for B. What does it mean to be sound for B? Well, it means this. It means that if a point is below B of F of X, then X is indeed below the greatest fixed point of B. So X being below the greatest fixed point of B is what we are interested in proving. And without the enhancement, we would have to show that X is a postfix point. Yeah, we can get a little bit of help from F. This is, this is the idea, okay? And this notion of soundness in the setting of uh, bisimilarity is exactly the notion of soundness that I had mentioned before. Um, now, what is a condition ensuring soundness? Uh, before I mention respectfulness, uh, here in the setting of complete lattice is more elegant to use something different, something called compatibility introduced by the Mian Pus. Uh, it's very similar to respectful, just a little different, but uh, this difference in complete lattices is makes things more elegant. So uh, F is B compatible if uh, F of B is below B of X. So this is commutativity property. Um, and this, uh, if this property implies the progression preservation property that I mentioned before. Um, so it is, uh, um, in fact, as I said, in fact, the, 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 this, 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 this compatible function are very similar to the, to the respectful function. Uh, so compatibility implies soundness um, and also compati compatible and respectful function have similar compositionality properties. Respectfulness is somehow less demanding. So for instance, up to context is respectful, but not compatible in general. Uh, interestingly, some years ago, independently, Paru and Weber and Pust showed that, showed that there is a largest respectful function and the largest compatible function. And surprisingly, they coincide. Uh, so Pust called this the companion. And interestingly, the companion itself is a conductive object. Therefore, enhancements can be used to prove that a given function is below the companion. And this gives higher order enhancements. Essentially, you use enhancements not to show a bisimilarity result. This would be uh, a first order enhancement, but to show that uh, another function can be used as a first order enhancement. So it's really, uh, it's, it's quite nice. Um, so by similarity have as this strength of the of the proof method, but however it has also been criticized. Uh, for instance, two critics that have been uh, put forward are that by similarity is uh, sometimes too fine. Uh, by similarity does not have a natural associated priority order, so it's not the kernel. It's not naturally the kernel of some of a preorder. Here is uh, a couple of examples illustrating the point. Consider this variant of the previous servers. Um, this is a variant in which the auxiliary server is uh, non-deterministic. So non-deterministically, it throws, uh, it sends an integer, okay? Actually, I made another modification. Um, instead of recursion, I'm using replication. So the eager and the lazy server, they are replicated at the channel B and uh, an output at B is essentially a call of uh, the server. So I'm using replication because it makes proofs uh, here uh, a, little, a little nicer. Uh, but apart from these, uh, things are the same. So the eager server is one that interrogates the auxiliary server first before, waiting, before uh, receiving a request from a client and the lazy server does the opposite. Uh, and uh, even with a non-deterministic auxiliary server, from a client perspective, the difference between the eager and the lazy system is not observable. I mean, a client makes a request, and then later on it will be involved in, the, in this interaction protocol, but the client has no way of, of observing whether internally to the system, uh, the interaction with auxiliary server occurs before or after 
the client request uh, as, uh, uh, has been made. So for this reason, we would like to consider the two, uh, the two systems equal, but, but they are not by similar. They are not by similar. They are not even simulation equivalent, in fact. Um, for instance, because uh, of this, consider the tau action in the system whereby the eager, uh, the eager uh, server interacts with the auxiliary server receiving an integer. Okay, this is a tau action that is a commitment to using a specific end in the following interaction protocol with a client. So this is a specific commitment to uh, a certain integer. Now, a bisimilar process should make a, should, should match this action, but the latest system cannot, because in order to make the commitment, the commitment uh, can be made here, uh, but before making that, it has to receive the, a request from a client, and this is a visible action. So by similarity, a tau action cannot be answered by a visible action. So they're not, uh, they not equal. Um, so by similarity here, it, it's just too, uh, too strong, too fine. It can, it can, the observation is too um, um, detailed somehow. This is another example. This is another example in which I'm considering a variant of the lazy server in which uh, uh, this variant here, well, uh, this lazy, uh, this forgetful uh, 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 lazy server simply throws, throws away the integer received from the auxiliary server and uses always the same integer, in this case, five. So we have a five instead of an X. Uh, of course, uh, now the forgetful system is not the same as the original system uh, because the forgetful system is more constrained, there's less non determinism. However, um, if we had a preorder, we could express this. We would like to express this. We, we would like to be able to say that at, at least uh, to be able to say that everything that, that happens in the forgetful system can also happen in the ordinary system, but we cannot using the similarity because as I said before, uh, it does not have an, a, a, a preorder from which it is produced. Now the literature of concurrency theory has many uh, pre-order and equivalences that uh, um, overcome these problems. And um, typically these, uh, these uh, uh, relations are uh, inductive in the sense that they, they are uh, based on observables that are inductively defined. Uh, uh, traces, as I said before, or a rigid form of traces, uh, trace, the trace pre-order, of course. Uh, um, the failure pre-order, which is uh, the predominant uh, uh, Preorder used the preorder, the predominant preorder behavior relation used in the CSP community, where you observe traces followed by a refusal set. That is a set of action that the process is unable to perform. Uh, and then we find in the literature the failure trace preorder where refusal set are observed at any point along a trace of action. And then we have the ready pre-ordering, which is like the failure pre-order, but you observe at the end of a trace, the ready set of a process rather than refusal set, rather than a refusal set. And the ready, the ready set of a process is the maximum set of actions that the process can perform. Uh, and a little bit surprising, perhaps this is not the same as the failure pre-order. Uh, and also you can add the ready trace pre-order, okay? So, uh, uh, in the remaining part of the talk, I would like to discuss an attempt at transferring the, the, the algebra of enhancements uh, uh, developed for by simulation onto this inductive uh, realm. And uh, of course, I will take an operational, concrete operational approach, uh, like the one that discussed with uh, uh, by simulation. I will not take uh, the complete lattice approach also because I don't know how to do it. Um, so first of all, I have to say what is precisely what is an inductive behavioral equivalence. As I said before, it's an equivalence, well, an equivalence, a preorder. In fact, we work with preorder now. Um, so it's a relation based on observables that are inductively defined. Um, so what is an observable? So for the definition of observables, I use uh, model logic. In fact, I use the positive fragment of any similar logic. Eh? So we have the diamond operator, the conjunction, I also use atomic observables. And uh, the meaning of this uh, operator is, uh, well, the, the, the obvious one, so diamond, the P has uh, this observable new theta. If P is a transition new to some P prime that has the observable theta. 
conjunction, uh, well, as you expect, uh, um, con this conjunction can be infinite. Uh, if it is empty, then we have the true. So the, 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 the true, I have the true, the true formula. Um, atomic observables, I require them to be local. That is, uh, their, their truth depends only on the immediate transitions that the process can perform. As a matter of fact, I will only need the refusal uh, atomic observable. Uh, so the ref mu uh, observable that holds for a process that is unable to perform mu. So an observable is a formula of, from this grammar, and the family of observables is a subset of such formulas. Uh, if you have a family of observables, then you get uh, uh, a preorder, and this produces a preorder on processes whereby, whereby a process is below, is below another one if all observables for the first process are also observables for the second process. Um, Notice that, you know, uh, just a, a comment on the fact that I have this positive fragment of the Ennis Minder logic. Uh, um, two reasons for this. One is that uh, in this way, every observable, every formula is really a concrete observable. A formula really uh, tells us about a structure of transitions that we want to observe. And uh, another, another point is that uh, in the result that will come, um, well, I, I, I don't know how to maintain the result that will come with extensions of this grammar. So it's really, um, it's really, I, I, it's really, uh, this is a more, it's a, a more stronger reason if you want. Um, um, examples, so with, this, with these observables, I can recover all the preorders that I mentioned before from the trace preorder to the failure preorder ready uh, and all that. And this simply because it is well known that these preorders have model logic characterizations in which I only need uh, the operators from this grammar. Okay, so, so there's nothing new here, so I can skip this slide really. Um, now let me go to enhancements for the inductive, uh, for this inductive world. For these enhancements, I need notions of weight and approximation. And uh, um, so uh, weights. Uh, Weights, uh, uh, this is the notation, this is the notation. Uh, the notation says that a process P has an observable uh, theta at uh, weight or level N, if there is a proof of uh, P theta in which the tree of transitions emanating from P is explored up to a depth not greater than N. Okay, so uh, if you want, I, I check at most N consecutive uh, transitions uh, of P. Uh, so for instance, um, if P is, uh, if, if, if uh, the observable is this one A, B true, of course, uh, then a process that has this observable can be assigned a weight too, because I need to check only, uh, I, I, I only it, it, it is sufficient to check two consecutive transitions of uh, the process P. And the rules for weight are, uh, are, really, uh, are really straightforward. I think there is no need to comment further. Um, having introduced weights, then I have approximants. Uh, so the nth approximant of the preorder is uh, one in which uh, uh, P is below Q. If uh, whenever P has an observable theta at weight N, then Q is also that observable. Uh, note that there is no N here. I could in, in a strong semantics, but for weak semantics, uh, I cannot. And so I've done that for uniformity with the weak semantics. Um, also, by the way, of course, the, the notion of weight that I've introduced here, if I have a strong semantics, this, of course, has, uh, has to do with uh, the level of nesting of uh, the diamond operator, OK? Uh, but again, in the weak semantics, this would not be the case. Um, so a preorder is measurable now if whenever P has a certain observable, then um, um, such a property can, can be weighted. So there is an end that can be assigned to that. Um, if the, um, uh, sorry, this is a, a, a put, oh, I should have put the preorder here. So if the preorder is measurable, then the preorder is also can be approximated. Now, this is the crucial slide where I use weight to define what are the inductive enhancements. 
um, as I said, I take a very concrete operational approach, like uh, the one for my simulation uh, at, the, at the beginning of my talk. Um, and again, I, uh, um, the starting point is the notion of uh, progression, the, the notion of progression with, uh, with some important uh, uh, modifications. Uh, first of all, since we are dealing with pre-orders, now uh, we don't have progressions, but semi-progressions. We are uh, uh, interested in reading this diagram in one way, so from uh, left to right only. Uh, but the most important difference has to do with uh, the interpretation, the, well, the interpretation of the function f. Of course, the function f should be sound for, uh, uh, for a given pre-order. Uh, so I'm not saying what is the pre-order, so the generic uh, uh, definition, the pre-order, this is any pre-order induced by uh, a family of observables in the way that I have described it earlier. So f is sound. Uh, for a given pre-order, if whenever I have a semi-progression of this kind, then it is indeed the case that R is contained in the pre-order. To be precise in this definition, uh, the quantification of R is constrained to those R that complies with the atomic observable. Okay, so if A is an atomic, if, 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 if a process in a pair of R has uh, an observable, then also the other process should have it. But this is somehow a secondary point that you want. Doesn't, doesn't matter to comment, uh, no need to comment it uh, a lot. Um, okay, this is, a, this, is, this is an important definition. Um, what is the condition? So I want, a, I want a, um, a, sufficient, a condition that is sufficient to guarantee soundness and, and also capable of guarantee of uh, producing a set of functions that's good comp compositionality properties. So um, the notion I proposed here is the notion of uh, weight preservation. So F is uh, uh, weight preserving for a given pre-order if uh, whenever a relation is in the nth approximant of that pre-order, then also F of R is in that approximant. So F is preserving um, uh, weights in this sense. And then the theorem says, if the pre-order is measurable and F preserves weights, then F is indeed sound uh, for, for a given, given pre-order. So in the co-inductive realm, uh, we, the condition that we had from soundness was progression preservation. Here we have weight preservation. So this is the difference between the two, uh, the two words. Um, the proof of the theorem is not particularly hard. Uh, since the pre-order is measurable, we can go by induction on N. And then in the inductive step, uh, we use the property that F is weight preserving, uh, of course, and, uh, and then use the, 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 the fact that we have uh, a semi-progression of this kind, and, uh, and then we reason on the shape of uh, each uh, concrete observable. Um, a comment I wanted to make is that um, weights uh, are important here. Um, if uh, I take a different, uh, um, uh, a different condition instead of weight preservation, so a condition not mentioning weights, for this, so a condition that uh, only mentions the pre-order, for instance, this one, uh, if, uh, if R is contained, is contained in the pre-order, then also F of R is contained in that pre-order, okay? Um, then the theorem would be false. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is unsound. In fact, uh, um, I was somehow, led to, to using weights by trying to have uh, the theorem, uh, theorem uh, sound. Hopefully it is sound now. Uh, so the, weight preserve, the, the set of weight preserving functions enjoys similar compositionality properties to the respective function. So weight preserving function can be composed using composition, union, chaining, like the respective function. Uh, we also have the identity, the, 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 the closure under uh, uh, monadic context. Uh, um, uh, there is an interesting, uh, well, something interesting, interesting could be said about up to context. So for a given pre-order, up to context is not always sound. Eh? It depends on the language. So something that would be interesting here is to develop abstract condition that guarantee for a given pre-order and, and a given language uh, uh, the soundness of the corresponding up to context uh, enhancement. So I've 
trying to do some preliminary work in this direction, but there is still, uh, I mean, this is very preliminary. So it's something that uh, for future work, I'm quite interested. Um, so here, is an ex here are some examples of applications. I consider the previous two examples. Uh, so this is the, the example that we've seen before of the eager and lazy system that were not bisimilar with a non-deterministic auxiliary server. Um, okay. Um, well, uh, I commented before that uh, these systems were not bisimilar. They are, however, equivalent for the equivalence in use by any of the pre inductive preorders that I've mentioned before. So from trace inclusion to, to, to the Taylor uh, uh, preorder to the Ray preorder, uh, all of them. Um, and uh, the proof uh, using enhancement is uh, similar to the proof that uh, I've shown at the beginning of the talk for bisimilarity. In fact, uh, even simpler because here, I can work with a relation that has just a single compare, uh, the eager and the lazy system. And what I can do is I show that uh, uh, such a relation progresses, semi-progresses uh, to this thing here. So this is, this is a semi-progression semi up to preorder and up to context. As I said, this is, any of the, this is an arbitrary preorder. So any of the preorder that we've seen before that I mentioned before. And of course, since I want to prove the result for the equivalence, not just the preorder, then I have also to prove the semi-progression in the converse direction. Um, so it's actually, this is in fact, uh, by the way, it's a parametric proof. Yeah, I'm carrying out a proof that is valid for uh, a bunch of uh, uh, equivalences. And as I said, the proof is similar to the proof that we have seen before for bisimilarity, um, a transition from this side, a transition on the other side, um, then I apply some uh, algebraic, uh, simple algebraic laws, mainly the function law, but in this case, I also use this law here. Of course, I need something else because uh, the equality is not valid for bisimilarity. So I, I need at some point this law, which is, this is a distributivity law uh, for prefixes under summation. This uh, sigma is a summation. And this law is valid for all the inductive preorders that we have seen before, but it's not valid for bisimilarity. And then at the end, I end up with systems like these, in which uh, the red part is a common contest. I cut it off, and uh, I am done. Uh, similarly, I can carry out the proof for the, uh, the other example I've shown before, the, the, the forgetful lazy server. Uh, so the, the lazy server in which that throws away the integer received from uh, the auxiliary server using five, uh, where, I, where I, I, I said that it would be interesting to have that proof using a preorder. Well, now we have preorders because we are in the inductive realm. And in fact, I can make a proof that is similar to the previous one. Sorry, this is, this is an extra bracket here. And uh, I show that, well, like one shows a semi-progression of this kind. So R uh, uh, semi-progresses to up to preorder and context. Um, the only noticeable difference with respect to the previous proof is that at some point I use this law. Um, this is a law saying that if I reduce the non-determinism in a process, then I go down in the preorder, okay? Um, this was expected because, uh, uh, of course, the, the forgetful system is more constrained, is, has less non-determinism than the ordinary uh, system. I wanted to mention another example uh, because it's of a different nature. Um, and I, well, I kind of like it. And also it was, uh, it was, it was, it was somehow influential in the, in triggering me to, to, to look into this uh, questions of uh, enhancements for induction. And this is a, an example that has to do with uh, Matthew Hennessy proof system for trace inclusion. So this is a sound and complete uh, proof system for trace inclusion that Matthew Hennessy uh, developed a few years uh, ago. Um, for uh, uh, regular CCS processes. So this is the language. 
Um, so in the case of trace equivalence, uh, proof systems for uh, regular uh, processes had, had existed for, uh, for many years. Uh, and typically they are based on a, unique, a, a rule of unique fixed point induction of this kind. Now for trace inclusion, uh, this rule does not seem to be uh, strong enough and sufficient, sufficiently powerful. And as, as far as I know, the problem of uh, uh, defining, finding a proof system summary complete for, for trace in, uh, inclusion, so language inclusion, um, had been open since uh, Matthew Hennessy work. Uh, of course, uh, here the, the question is finding a proof system a direct a, a proof system for, tra for trace inclusion that is direct in the sense that it does not refer to a proof system for trace equivalence. I guess this is really straightforward, but it will come to have a primitive proof system. Now, Hennessy system, in Hennessy system, judgments are of this kind. So there is a, a finite bunch of premises of this form, and then a conclusion again of this form. Um, and this, uh, this is a sample of rules. There is no unique fixed point induction. And instead of that rule, there are other rules. The most interesting one is this correct rule. This is a rule that has, has a, a conductive flavor. It says that whenever you have two processes with the same prefix on top, then you can put these two processes in the premises and uh, you keep going with, with what is left, um, cutting the prefix. Okay, and then there are of course uh, rules for uh, managing the managing the um, uh, the premises. Uh, for instance, this rule, these weakening rules, and then this uh, this rule for using using uh, uh, the premise. Um, so the question I'm, I'm uh, uh, the, the the question here is the soundness of such a proof system, and uh, um, so coming to. To, to the problem of sound of, of soundness, uh, um, one has to establish what, what what does it mean that a given judgment is valid. Okay, so Hennessy uh, discusses first uh, what what is uh, uh, arguably the, the the natural the natural approach. The natural approach would be to consider such a judgment valid if, uh, whenever all pairs in the premises are in the trace. Uh, uh, inclusion uh, pre-order, this is a trace inclusion pre-order, then also the conclusion is in the trace inclusion pre-order, okay? And uh, Matthew's uh, analysis shows that this is actually unsound. And then uh, uh, he goes on to uh, using instead a stratified interpretation that rewritten in the setting that I have described earlier on is more or less this, uh, saying that for all uh, approximants of the trace uh, uh, pre-order, whenever the premises are in the approximant, then also the conclusion is so. Then the soundness proof essentially shows that each proof rule in the system preserves these stratified semantics. So in the setting of, in the setting of enhancements... David, sorry, uh, uh, you should be wrapping up. Because right. Um, I take uh, yeah uh, three three minutes something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, in in our setting, in the setting of enhancements, uh, this uh, all this amount. So the proof amounts to do the following. Um, first of all, one each proof rule corresponds to a weight preserving function, and there are several of them, like the transitive closure, concave closure, up to transitive, up to the trace preorder, blah blah. Uh, call f the set of such function, then the soundness proof essentially shows that given any given proof tree in the system yields, so I can extract from this proof tree, a relation uh, R on processes such that this relation progresses to this thing here. This is the closure of R under the given function that can be used as many times as, as you want, and they can be composed using function composition and, uh, and union. So it's, uh, it's, this, it's this, uh, this closure. Overall, the proof is not particularly simpler than, uh, than Hen, it's not simpler than Hennessy proof, but, uh, um, well, I was, uh, uh, I find it uh, uh, interesting because it, it's, uh, it's another way of reading, uh, uh, of formulating, of reading Hennessy proof, which is, which is, in my opinion, rather non-standard proof. 
And, and also, um, I like it because uh, it has uh, this rather sophisticated combination of enhancements. So I'm fully exploiting the compositionality property of the, this algebra of uh, uh, weight preserving function that I've developed. Uh, I, I, I had anticipated at the beginning that they would not have had time to discuss weak semantics, but uh, just a, a word in the setting of weak semantic where one extracts from tau action, enhancements for by simulation tend to be more delicate. Certain constructors are not sound like chaining. So one has to find ways out uh, uh, and arguably the theory is less elegant. Um, in the case of uh, inductive enhancements, uh, something similar happens. Uh, and, uh, but there is a little bit more flexibility now because uh, we, we can play with the notion of weight, a weak weight, and uh, I've done a little bit of work in that direction, but more work I think is needed. Uh, so I have a very nice chairman and they want to make uh, her angry, so I want to <laughs> close uh, uh, quickly, I got questions, uh, future work, possibly interesting future work. After formulation, I have, I have uh, this is a question concerning these inductive enhancements. Uh, I would very much like to see what is an after formulation of these inductive enhancements. I've really no idea how to do that. Uh, what are the fixed points? I don't know, is at least the greatest fixed point, um, let alone category theory, uh, you know, uh, to algebra, in algebras, I don't know. Um, Another interesting question for me is uh, concerning weak semantics. In weak semantics, there are some of the preorders that I've mentioned, for instance, failure preorder, make use of observables that are naturally conductively defined, like divergence. So the question here, how to refine the framework that I've shown so to accommodate both inductive and conductive uh, observables. And finally, there's a question about the up to context that I've partially already uh, discussed. Uh, so in the setting of conductive enhancements up to context can be used to derive congruent substitutivity property, congruence property for uh, uh, by similarity in a given language. Uh, something similar can be done here in the setting of inductive enhancements, but it would be like to be able to connect somehow the soundness of uh, um, up to enhancement up to context enhancement to congruence uh, substitutiv substitutivity property for a given preorder. Okay, stop here. Sorry if I've been a little bit, a little long. Uh, yes, well, anyhow, we have the coffee break now, so it's not, <laughs> it's not too bad, but uh, thanks very much, Davide, for this uh, impressive and long-sighted <laughs> view <laughs> of, um, uh, of the landscape of uh, the various uh, enhancements. And uh, so um, I had seen uh, previously, but uh, not immediately actually, a question by Daniele Baracca. Uh, this is when you introduced uh, both ACT and, uh, and the set A of basic observables. And he was asking whether you really need both of them, but maybe he's uh, solved his doubts since then. Uh, I don't know if, uh, so, can you all see it? So I cannot, uh, I, what, what, is, what is the, the question? I cannot... The question is, uh, yeah, if you go ah, back to the slide. Do you really need both uh, ACT and A? Um, well, yes, so ACT is a set of actions, so, um, I need to, I need, of course, uh, when I, when I define, uh, when I work, uh, well, I need somehow to, uh, to say what, what is a set of actions. Uh, um, this is act. A, B, A was a set of atomic observables. And uh, um, I am using here for the preorder that I mentioned, I'm using the refusal preorder. Sorry, the refusal atomic observable. And um, um, in weak semantics, I'm using also the, uh, um, the atomic observable become more sophisticated because um, I need also stability. So for instance, in the failure preorder, in the ready preorder, uh, refusal, refusal set, ready set are observed on stable state. So there the atomic observables become more, um, a little bit richer, but indeed, I don't need uh, very many atomic observables, at least for the preorders in the literature. Okay, so um, I thought for a long time about uh, whether I should just uh, stick to some 
precise, concrete, uh, uh, atomic observables or not. And uh, I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure really. Also at some point, also I was, I was thinking, well, maybe some of these atomic observable can have to do with, they may have to do with divergence. But um, well, well, so far I, um, I cannot, I, I, was not, I was not able to, to handle that. Um, then there is another question in the Q and A uh, menu, if you can see it, Where by Nobuko. Uh, can you see in the Q and A uh, ah, menu okay. a question there are, by Nobuko? Right. There are many ways to define inductive observables. Your work will contribute to define the minimum observable for the inductive case. For example, in a synchronous pi, is output only observable or input only observable would be, would be a choice but the output is minimum. Uh, so, um, uh, right. Uh, um, well, the framework that I have devised uh, is a framework for describing uh, obs the observable one is interested in. Um, then, uh, depending on uh, the way you define your preorder, you may use certain observables or you may use other observables. You may have redundant observables. Um, so um, this question of minimality is not something that I'm, I don't think is a question that I'm really uh, addressing. Um, um, I'm just uh, uh, trying to devise a framework in which I can describe the observable one is interested in. Of course, in the setting of uh, in the setting of the asynchronous state calculus that uh, um, Nobuko is mentioning, uh, there is also the issue of uh, mobility. That's something that I've not uh, uh, handled. It's not handled here. So it's a possible extension of uh, the work. Uh, um, uh, hopefully it will work, but uh, and honestly, I don't, I don't see why it should not work, but I've not checked all the details. And also in the setting of a synchronous pi, uh, for instance, uh, asynchronous by simulation, okay, the definition of, uh, there, are, uh, there are clauses with uh, the definition of uh, uh, by similarity that are a little bit different with respect to those uh, in the definition of standard by similarity. So, you know, a, a, an action can be answered by either by doing uh, a certain uh, toe action or by doing something else. Uh, so this is uh, a non-standard formulation of bisimilarity for which uh, we will need a different notion of progression. And this is some, again, this is something that uh, would have to be explored. Um, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure uh, whether, how to do it, how, how to best do it. But uh, indeed, this, is, this, this, uh, this would be interesting. Huh? This would be interesting. Um, yes, thanks, uh, Nobuko. Then I see a question by Luca. In yeah. Inductive, in the inductive setting, uh, do you need the weights to be preserved strictly by F? For instance, would it be enough to require that if R is contained in the approximate? Uh, yes, uh, no, uh, yes, I need that. I need uh, strict. I need uh, this uh, strictness. So if uh, R is in uh, the nth approximant, then f of r should be in the nth approximant too. And I need that in the inductive part of the proof, uh, because at some point I use uh, induction precisely there. Uh, so when I am working at, uh, with the n, the n plus one approximant, I refer to the nth approximant, and I need to know that, uh, n, that, that, that f uh, was uh, weight preserving for that. Okay, uh, there was, sorry, um, uh, there was, no, no, I, I don't see any more new question and I suggest we, we close uh, the session here. Uh, thanks again, Davide, for this very uh, inspiring talk, very nice, and uh, to all the participants and we have a short break now and we reconvene um, at, uh, when do we reconvene? Ah, at five for the session on session types.
Thank you very much. Thanks, Ilaria. Okay, we'll start uh, five minutes late the next session. Uh, and uh, if there are the, the chair and author of the next session, uh, I will have to close this session and you need to reconnect. Thank <laughs> you.